So welcome to Inspiring Interviews, Conversations About Breath. This is where we take a well-known facilitator each week and we find out about their journey as, uh, as they stepped into their magnificence and their awesomeness. Now, usually these interviews are about breath with well-known breathwork facilitators. But we have taken a leap uh, out into the dark today and we are going to be joined by Jamie Cato. Um, he's not a breath worker, but he is an astonishing facilitator that, for, uh, that has been changing people's lives for decades in workshops and with his book. And then before that, through and during, I suppose, as well, with his films and his music as well. So let's bring on Jamie now. Hi, Jamie, how are you doing? Hi there, my lovely Ben. Oh, lovely to I'm see you. I'm very good. I'm very good indeed. I just had the most glorious breathy walk on Hampstead Heath, inhaling all the beautiful springtime odours and scents and uh, the plants and the air and everything exuding such incredible follicle stimulating um natural healing vibes it's just been so delicious today i know it's uh hampstead heath is spacious enough to be able to maintain all our social yeah uh, necessary stuff while also having lots of space um and yeah wow what a time to be outside it's absolutely delicious out there well um i always like to start these interviews with taking a breath together so like if you're watching this We'll take a breath together and I want you to imagine that you are on Hampstead Heath at, on a glorious spring day when it's really quiet and no one else is around and all that beautiful nature that Jamie has just described is hitting you in the heart like a punch. Let's take a breath with that. There is nothing like a spring day. Um, and today is the, pretty much feels like the first day of spring where I am in Northern Canada as well. We've just been able to sit out on the deck for the first time and have a cup of tea, um, which hasn't happened before. You've been waist deep in snow since you moved there. I know. <laughs> um, okay, so what... I do in these interviews, Jamie, is um, I want to inspire people. I want to, people to inspire people into their breath, into their greatness, into their power, into their awesomeness, into the, you know, the realization that they are magnificent. magnificent. And the way I do that is um, I find facilitators, often breath workers, but you're obviously a little bit different for people who have already taken that journey. And I want to hear the stories about your journey, because this is what I think inspires people, hearing about people's journeys. And obviously there's the, 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 the great magnificent things that you've done, but there is also the challenges and the hard bits and the long dark nights that I know that you will have come through. Because when people hear about that and when they see you in your vulnerability and they see how you have met those challenges and you have still carried on and maybe still facing them. That for me is what inspires me when I see real people, real people, you know, who aren't just these perfect, amazing beings we see on Instagram or Facebook, but real people who have done something incredible and um, with all the challenges that go with it. That's what I find inspiring. So I'm going to ask you about your, your life story. You know, we'll take you through back and I in encourage you to go to the, the difficult places and the challenging places and the tender places as well as just the amazing stuff as well. Is all that okay Yeah, with you? Bring it on. Good. All right. Well, let's start with a quick Jamie 101. For people who maybe haven't met you before, um, I'm going to give you one minute, maybe 90 seconds. I mean, with you, probably you could go on for a whole hour, but see if you can get it down to one or two minutes. What are the details? What are the facts? What are the things that, that we should know about you and your life? Maybe what you've done. Tell us about Jamie, 101, 90 seconds, go. Go. Well, pre-career, um, 
I uh, was very much of a misfit through my school life and my childhood uh, in my family because um, I didn't fit with the usual model that we were given of certain kinds of dishonesty. You only say this, you only show that. Don't let them see you're vulnerable. Make sure you don't ever see yourself or be seen to fail. Make sure, make sure um, you fit in. All, all the things that everybody, the rule book everybody is given never fitted well with me and I didn't know why. Um, so I found myself a bit of a blurter, a bit of a, um, a um, transgressor and um, was kind of pegged as a problem child. And then um, later in life, as I, when I left school, and I went into my first sort of jobs, like as a runner in an animation house and things like that. People treated me with usual ambivalence, um, didn't particularly care about me either way. Um, but that was such a step up for me that I just thought, these people love me. And I, I started really excelling because <laughs> I had such an incredible burst of confidence to not be just kind of tagged as a problem kid and rejected and, and you know, sent out the room. Um, and uh, my position, so I made lots of films. I was in a group called Faithless, and then we created One Giant Leap, which is a kind of a musical movie journey around the world uh, with inspiring people and players and singers. And then wrote a book called Insanely Gifted and did more like workshops and mentoring. And I realized quite recently that my position on how to be a person and what is the way to, to drink the great nectar of life that's available in this quite brief time we have as a self-cherishing ego for like 70, 80 years, if you're lucky. My position hasn't changed since I was five years old um, on what, what life is all about, you know, and that authenticity is so lacking in today's mainstream culture where we're taught to wear a mask, only show people certain things, hide vulnerabilities, hide our mess, hide our fallibility, hide our shadowy characteristics and only show the brochure shop window of each other and ourselves. Um, I realized that, you know, I want to promote the lovely self-love and universal love of bringing more of ourselves, even if it seems by our culture standards a bit more risky and a bit less um, normal, that the great tr deliciousness of life is to be found not in the shop window and in the safe vanilla way we, we present ourselves to each other, but we fall in love with each other's eccentricities. We fall in love with each other's edges. We fall in love with the intimacy that comes with showing a bit more than the usual. And I've been dedicating my life to creating such a positive impact through that kind of philosophy and intimacy as I possibly can while I breathe. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. The edges and the intimacies. That's a great phrase. Um, and the vulnerability. And I think that's what drew me to you when I met you, actually, that you um, acknowledge and you recognize and you even embrace that. So you inspire a lot of people, but let's find out a little bit about what inspired you. Now, you mentioned when you were young that you were a bit of a misfit and you didn't really fit in. So maybe let's go back to that time. Maybe let's go back to little Jamie. Um, now, first of all, and you can choose a point in, you know, your childhood that you would like to talk about. Let's talk about what inspired little Jamie. What did little Jamie like doing? What was his joy? And maybe there was someone who stood out for you then. Hmm. Um, one of the things that inspired me as a little boy was my internal world. Um, that I experienced a lot of, I was alone a lot. And I used to see faces and through looking out the window through the branches of the trees. I used to hear whispering in the river as it went past. I had a very, very strong connection to magical, lyrical kind of things that, um, that may be very normal to some people and, and very sort of woo-woo to others. But I would feel that nature was talking to me and that the sky was talking to me and maybe angels were talking to me or the kind of you know my, my cuddly toys were talking to me you know when I looked into the eyes of my soft toys as a little boy I really felt there was someone in there I didn't kind of I felt they had a prayer to go to my room and make sure that if any of them were like lying on their sides or on their front with their head underneath um 
I would always kind of make sure all my soft toys were sitting up and comfortable so that when I left for school, they wouldn't be uncomfortable all day while I was away. You know, I really felt that they were real. Um, so I drew a lot of my inspiration in my early life, not from other humans, but from the magic that was talked to me through, yes, especially these faces I would see through the branches of trees. I would stare at them and it really felt like actual beings were there looking back at me. Um, and I used to really get very personally involved in the stories that I would listen to. When I was a little boy, I would often be put to bed with a story tape. Um, and I used to really get very involved, like those characters in those stories. I can just feel the feeling now in my heart, as I tell you, I used to feel very connected to stories, characters in these stories, almost more than the actual humans who were around me. Mm. And I'm sure if there's any psychotherapist listening to this, they would have a, have a, uh, a word for that, that, you know, that needs some medication, um, some sort of disassociation from the actual world I was in. But I found that that access to that magical or that beyond the usual edges and, and uh, normalness of everyday humans and the material plane has been the same aperture the same route that has connected me to the part of me that writes songs, that makes movies, that mentors people and feels quite a psychic connection with them, quite a bodily connection. When I'm working with someone one-on-one, -on -one, even if they're on the other side of the planet, when they start talking about something and their upper chest or their throat starts closing up, I can feel my upper chest mm. and throat closing up. So yeah, whatever the, the, the good um, um, side effect of all that aloneness was that it made me cultivate other abilities or other sensitivities that I didn't get met in by the humans. And I, and I even though I, I'm not playing a little violin here, even though I wasn't the happiest little boy, um, it definitely like a blind person has to amp up their ability to touch and feel around through touch and, and sound. Um, I think that certain other lyrical creative and sensitive places in me woke up because there was less human contact. Mm. Um, I can really feel little Jamie here and what a beautiful little boy <laughs> um, being able to see past just the physical material world into how magical it really is and seeing the magic in nature and the faces in trees and seeing the soul inside the eyes of your little cuddly toys and drifting off to sleep, really connecting with the stories that you were told on a story tape. Mm. And maybe, and it is absolutely fine to play a violin here. You know, if I could put some, if I can edit in some background music here, <laughs> uh, we can do that. Um, and then you mentioned maybe briefly your family or the, the, the people that you weren't connecting quite so much that gave you space to connect to this magical world. So maybe tell us in about some of the, the details of your life back then. Paint us a picture of, you know, uh, your family, your where you lived. Um, what was life like for you as a, uh, as a, as a youngster? Well, um, I was brought up in quite a sort of wealthy Jewish home in Hampstead in London. Didn't see much of my mum or dad. I was mainly cared for by a long string of nannies. Um, very few of which didn't, you know, wanted to engage, you know, did more than give you your fish fingers and put you in the bath. Um, and I had an elder brother and a younger sister. Again, we were all quite solitary. We weren't all like playing together very much. We were, we were like in our own rooms doing whatever we were doing. Um, and, uh, I went to a school in St. John's Wood, which was pretty strict and very, very much about, you know, appearances and your shiny blazer and your tie and, you know, like the old school British kind of way, you know, they were allowed to whack you around in the seventies. Um, and, um, yeah, I, um, it wasn't until I was about eight or nine that I met somebody who really took interest in me, who was um, 
who was my mum's business partner. And he wasn't at all from our kind of cultural background. He was a British working class man, football on a Sunday afternoon um, from Potter's Bar. And um, he used to take me when all the older boys were able to go off and have sort of snogging sessions with their girlfriends in our early teens. And I was like the sort of slightly late developing prepubescent wanting to join in boy uh he kind of would take me with him like as his little mascot and let, i get to go and play football training with him and his guys and they kind of you know made a bit of a fuss of me and teased me and like made me feel like i was part of the gang mm. and that absolutely blew my heart open and there was nothing i wouldn't have done for this man uh, in fact, I remember when I was 13 and that we had a school expedition in, in the second school I went to and that you, you couldn't get out of these expeditions. You were going to walk on, you know, climb Mount Snowdon or go potholing in Dorset or whatever it was. You couldn't get out of it. It was a thing that you absolutely had to do. And I was refusing to go. Um, and I remember my mum sending him upstairs and within five minutes of him telling me he thought I should go I was up I was dressed I had my rucksack and being brave about it you know there was nothing I wouldn't do for this man <laughs> um, let's, let's really honor him here and acknowledge him because one of my questions is who really inspired you back then and it sounds like we've just stumbled onto that person so what was his name Jamie he was called Mike he is called Mike and there was a little sad twist to it um because my mum ended up leaving my dad for this man and it was in the time it, it was the first divorce anyone knew about certainly in our circle i was the first boy in our school to have divorced parents everyone was like really freaked out oh, your parents are getting divorced this is like in 78 or something like that um it was like kramer versus kramer hadn't come over from america yet uh, you know it was absolutely like before the time where it was quite normal it was a massive taboo and therefore he was shunned you know he was an outcast he you weren't allowed to love him you know you were he was had to be especially in my dad's eyes he had to be you know the enemy um and according to my grandparents and you know everyone like he was he was bad news he was the one that had broken up the home he was blah 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 um so there was this very strange tearing that happened to me at that age around 10 um 11 maybe where he was the one guy that i loved so much but i had my permission to love him taken away like and it's not like i had to take a stand against him and be rude to him or anything but i remember when he came to the house after i had first been told everything that was going on and being so confused um about not how am i supposed to look at this man how am i supposed to treat this man what what happens now with this man you know um it was a really strange one um but um we all got through it um and uh yeah but it, it definitely shifted something in that absolute pure adoration i had because he then played the role in life for my whole family of you know the baddie mm -hmm. and either i had to be in exile or i had to go along with it and i think i kind of mainly chose being an exile because i already was one and and so i didn't i didn't quite go along with it so there was definitely like you know there were repercussions to that but i remember that being a very very confusing time because he didn't know when he came to the house that that's the moment that i'd been told so i remember his kind of confused usually big ear to ear grinning face that would greet me seeing that there was something wrong but not knowing yet that i'd been told so he was like kind of confused by it i really remember that day mm. uh well let's just take a breath with him first because he is it feels like a very pivotal and a very important person and that has taught you many lessons so let's just have a breath breath with mike as well and let's have a breath with that first mike that you knew before those changes when you know you were still adoring him before the the confusion came in mm.
because we all need someone like that, don't we, Jamie? That kind of person who's going to look out for us, who cares for us, who loves us, who is going to make us feel special and make us feel part of something. Um, and, you know, if we don't always find that in our family or our school, it sounds like, um, you know, a privileged upbringing is probably harder in many respects than people who, who don't have all that. Um, and I've heard that story from other people about how hard it is um to kind of go through that system if you are an outcast or if you're an exile or if you don't quite fit in well it's very much our education system whether you're being a posh one like i was in or any of them as uh, noam chomsky put it very lucidly in the one giant leap film he was like you know like our system is not there to serve free thinkers it's there to serve the people who will toe the line and fit in and become obedient worker bees. Or as George Carlin said, people who were just smart enough to do the paperwork and operate the machinery and just dumb enough to put up with the total, you know, uneven, um, unfair system. Um, so yeah, um, I didn't fit in with it because I've always been, artistic you know and always been like kind of a free thinker and like yeah but what if we do it this way you know like not not i think as a child you know obviously we're all made to be approval addicts when we're little the first chapter of my book insanely gifted is called how we became approval addicts you know when we're little and we're shown how to be a somebody by our parents the way we're taught is you get it right you get the love you get it not right it's taken away a little bit or worse you know you get punished or whacked around the head so when you give something great and take it away and give something great and take it away, that creates addiction in the human. And we're all created into little approval addicts um, when we were young. Um, and but I, as a child, didn't really see it that way. Like for me, it became boring. Like if you, if you get the right answer and the computer goes, being good boy, okay, get the right answer, computer goes, being good boy, get the right answer, the computer goes, being good boy. After a while, that becomes tiresome. And uh, so then actually you realize that getting the wrong answer, it asks you a question, you give a deliberately wrong answer, and then it goes always in a sort of uniquely informative way. You get much more interest in information and excitement by what happens when you give the wrong answer, not the right answer. What happens when you disrupt the normal even flow rather than just see the same boring wave go past. Mm. So I became always much more interested in that um, which again was infuriating understandably for all the people that were trying to get me to get the right answer i was much more interested in what happened when you did something weird or did something unexpected well um, that that kind of that kind of is it feels like that's what happened with you and your family which is where we got to in your narrative there was this kind of when um your parents split up and you were put in that position of um you know, a big disruption, something was going wrong. Take us back onto that part and, you know, where did you go from that? And what happened, what happened to, to Jamie, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old Jamie going forward from there? Well, um, I went to boarding school when I was just 13. Uh, I don't mean just 13 as in only 13. I meant as, you know, um, as I turned 13, and uh, it was it was kind of a strange situation get the violins out again it was a bit weird because i only lived 10 minutes away from the boarding school um but um i think my parents you know they needed to get on with their lives and they hadn't been very you know hands-on at the best of times um and so it was kind of just easier, mm -hmm. you know, to be at the school. Then somebody put you in a room to do your homework. They didn't have to, you know, oversee that. They didn't have to oversee getting you there in the morning. They didn't, you know, it, it was kind of easier. Um, and it was a very, very highly thought of school. It was like one of the top schools in the country. It's called Westminster. So there was, it was weird because I was such a misfit um, in an underachiever at school. They weren't going to let me take the exam. Uh, because I was going to bring down the school's average for people that got into schools and somehow they persuaded to let me do it and I totally failed the academic part of the exam but I killed it in the interview um, I, I can't remember that interview so much I just really loved 
they were such amazing interviewers. You know, they were really intelligent men. They were, I think I don't know if there was any women uh, in the interview. There was like three men who was like the headmaster and the head of English and the head of whatever else. And I just remember looking into them and they were taking an interest. And because they, again, they were taking an interest in me, mm. which was kind of a rarity, I shone. I was so like a sort of like that little bit of sunlight on the, on the seed. It immediately started sprouting like crazy. It was so sort of <laughs> ready to be anyone that was giving me any attention, you know? So like, I was just so alive in that interview and so ready to sort of make them laugh and make them interested and listen to what they want to ask me and, and show them that I was interested. I don't know what, what happened, but I, I was so on one during that interview and so excited to be talking to these three very interesting men who were asking me these questions, no one, you know, that I obviously killed it. And, and I remember like the, the, the report came back from Westminster Entry saying uneven results, but a very pleasing interview. So they let me in. Um, and uh, Westminster School, um, it, you know, I know it's incredible white male privilege that I went there. Is the most amazing place anyone could go to if you're the least bit artistic, mm -hmm. um, especially as a boarder. Even though I fought and screamed and felt like a victim for going to boarding school, I was like, "Why don't I, can't I come home?" You know, I was like that. But, but actually, when I look back, you know, it was so absolutely amazing to be there because you're right, basically, sort of right next to Westminster Abbey. So, one mile in that direction, you've got the National Gallery with all the Leonardo da Vinci and Donatello and Michelangelo, you know, incredible. One mile in that direction, you've got the Tate Gallery with all the sort of modern stuff and Jackson Pollock and Mondrian and Rothko and extraordinary stuff there. One mile that way, you've got the Royal Festival Hall, the Queen Elizabeth Hall, the Purcell Room on the South Bank with all the incredible orchestras and the flamenco that's come in from Spain and the incredible Italian cafe music and whatever is coming through England, the cream of it is, is shown there. And then one mile that way, you've got Shaftesbury Avenue and all the theatre district and all the most amazing plays that are going on. And you're right in the middle of all of it. And because it was um, this kind of a, you know, knobby school, if you joined the, the club, you all you had to do was write down on a list the play that you wanted to go to or the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto that you wanted to go and see or the Flamenco or the exhibition of the Rothko, whatever. And they got you two tickets and it just went on your bill at the end of the term. You never had anything to do with it. And every evening, so many evenings, you just would sign out. You'd go off wandering down the South Bank, age 14, 15, 16, experience something extraordinary, come back in time for lights out. I just had from 13 to 18, totally immersed in theatre, classical music, world culture music, fine art, you know, like I was right in the centre of the cream of everything. It was absolutely amazing. Mm. London has that special quality of when you're in the middle of it feeling like you are at the centre, centre of the universe. Um, and I love that energy creativity that just kind of buzzes around that so what an incredible experience you you must have had as a, as a young man who was open to that kind of creative you know magical experience of life's absolute wonder yeah i mean if you've never i don't know how many of your listeners have ever seen an orchestra play but when you just don't know what one is and it's like 107 musicians or whatever with bassoons and trombones and string sections and timpani drums and each one of those people has for years practiced and practiced and practiced to become you know the top of their field and then you're hit with the literally the breath of that sound wave of all of them in collaboration and in harmony with each other it's pretty impactful mm. and in fact they used to the way they, where they would put the students, where, where you would be sat, would actually be behind the orchestra often. So you would sit behind the timpani drums and follow the music and, and look at their sheet music and you would follow and like know when they were going to be hitting their bits and, and you would be really, really engaged over and over again with whatever concerto or symphony was being played, actually reading the music or whatever instrument you'd been sat behind. So that was super exciting as well. Mm. Yeah, that sounds incredible. I can feel, I can feel the, the timpani drums like on my skin, you know, I can, f I know what it's like to, to hear a full orchestra. It is an astonishing, astonishing experience. Um, so it feels like your, um, your experience in school was, was very 
nurturing maybe quite creative and kind of pushed you off in a, a allowed you to be the kind of creative person that you became um which is it which is which is fantastic jamie yeah i mean it was a very academic school mm. but it very very much honored creativity you know um one of the people you know a lot of people it was very 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 supportive they had amazing music rooms they had like you'd walk in and there were like six or eight soundproof rooms down either side of the corridor each with a piano in then you go into a bigger room where there were sort of drums and cellos and double basses and and you know it was quite boring in the evenings at boarding school if you weren't going off to go and do something you would sort of wander around maybe have a cigarette in the in the westminster abbey cloisters um but there wasn't really much to do within the school so i would just sort of you know find myself in the music room and just explore self-teaching myself whatever instrument was lying around mm. and uh, then you know gather with a few friends and you know we would start little bands and little experiments and you know they had all the time in the world to do that so yeah it was pretty cool in that way uh, it was very very much honored you know i went to school with louis theroux uh, who did the the tv show of um, interviewing very creative sort of documentary interview series i went to school with helena bonham carter you know the kind of plays that you were in were with some of the actors today who were like really celebrated on the screen and stuff you know seeing yeah. helena bonham carter age 16 playing eliza doolittle in pygmalion was one of the things i will never forget you know mm um and they had you know when they did a play at westminster the shakespeare play uh every year they had the costumes from angel and berman down the street who would be the co you know you would look inside your britches and you'd see like a tag that said laurence olivier or you know like they they you were wearing the costumes that the greats had worn in the in, in shaftesbury avenue you know and and it was all performed with proper lighting rigs on the side of these gardens up the sides of Westminster Abbey and stuff these extraordinary locations you know it was very 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 honored creativity even though it was quite an academic school uh that's amazing to, to have that experience um and for to be an outsider and to be a misfit and to be a creative but that's still to be supported um what a great what a great start to have in that because so many people don't aren't supported and aren't nurtured in that way and they're the only misfit or they're the only outsider in there but you know it sounds like you were uh, held in that space very much yeah and I, and also you know they would take this out of you as well do you know what i mean like they would they would they would support you but but they didn't support you earnestly they supported you like with a twinkle you know and i had this extraordinary english teacher um who was also stephen fry's english teacher this extraordinary man called rory stewart and uh he talks stephen talks about him in his first autobiography moab is my washpot which takes it's an absolutely brilliant book if, if you haven't read it the audio book and the paper book of moab is my washpot fantastic and he talks about rory stewart about what an incredible inspiration he goes the people that were taught by this man are almost like a club of people that all have had this honor of like oh my god you were taught by rory stewart and i remember the first if, if it doesn't take too long on the first lesson i ever had with this guy i was 14 and we all went and sat down and there was this guy didn't look particularly interesting he had big sideburns because it was you know that was the year um and he didn't introduce himself to the class or talk about the curriculum of english or anything that we were going to do he just sat down everyone settled down he goes in 1284 on a hillock south of edinburgh there were two brothers fighting a duel they were both in love with the milkmaid who their father had you know he starts just telling this beautiful story and in the duel you know one of the brothers gets killed and he has to leave the other brother has to leave the village because he's now outcast and he traveled this way where he got a job as an apprentice doing that and then he met someone they got married and he, he takes the whole 44 out of 45 minutes telling you this story that goes from all the way from 12 something to the to the present day all the way through all these fucking incredible places all the way down to the present day he goes where you see here elizabeth ii queen of england 
And everyone's like, wow. And he goes, but, and he goes all the way back to the beginning. He goes, if that milkmaid had not come around the corner at that exact moment and caught his eye, and then he would have won the duel, and then he would have gone here, and that would have happened. And, da, 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 and he goes all the way through what would have happened. And he goes, and therefore today, I would be the King of England. My name is Rory Stewart. And then the bell goes, ding, ling, ling. <laughs> and we're all just going to <laughs> Um, well, you know, let's, should we honor Rory, um, with a breath together? Completely. What a dude. That man vibrated with such aliveness. It was so infectious about the most boring thing. You know, I'm not saying that Milton is boring i actually think milton paradise lost is phenomenal but i i think maybe i think milton paradise lost is phenomenal because of him mm. he would make it come so alive you know oh well, i'm glad we got to, to hear about one of your inspirational teachers are there any is there anyone else from that kind of period in your life because you know that period when you're at secondary school there are some um, people who have a huge influence on you so is there anyone else you would like to to honor or acknowledge right now mainly him but there was this other guy who in himself it wasn't he wasn't like rory stewart in the fact that he made you come alive just by being near him but there was this guy um called uh, mr arthur john arthur who later became the housemaster after i left and what the reason he was so great was that he he ran the drama side of a lot of the school and he really let me join in a lot you know like he let me join in more than one person should be allowed i was in everything you know he, not in everything as an actor but he 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 was he saw to it that i was one of the first students that was actually allowed to direct their own play normally you would just the, the, the teachers would direct the plays the students would be in the plays and there was a house play kind of a thing going on and he allowed me to direct it and I had my first experience at age like 16, 17 of having like a cast of 50. Cause you know, the, the game with a house play was like the success of a house play wasn't just like, was it a good play? It was like, how many people could you get involved? That was like the real aim of a house thing is how many people in the house, whether it be the lighting or the set building or the acting or the whatever, how many people could you get involved in this thing? And he really helped me. Basically, there wasn't pretty much anyone in the whole house who wasn't doing something mm. in this endeavor. And I, I wasn't, I didn't direct it as a creative director very well at all. It, it was all I could do just to get everyone standing in the right places, saying the right things in order. I wasn't like particularly skilled at getting some great performance out of anyone or anything like that. But just the organization of the fun of a great big thing that was all happening uh, and stewarding that. He really, really supported me in that. And that has really been what I've been doing ever since in my career, which is bringing together lots of disparate elements, putting them in a certain pile, pressing go and watching a, a bigger thing happen that has nothing to do with me. Yeah. Uh, and he really made me, gave me the confidence to pull something like that off. So it sounds like, you know, he really gave you an opportunity and he gave a space for you to do that. Um, and he took an interest in you as well. And and that's what I'm, I'm feeling, you know, coming out from you with your interview. Um, and then a bit later on when you were a runner that um, you really responded to people who maybe saw something in your slightly creative misfit and then gave you an opportunity or trusted and liked you. And, and that you really responded well to. Absolutely. Um, well, let's, let's have a, a breath with uh, Mr. Arthur then, who really, you know, helped you step into your magnificence and your awesomeness, Jamie. Mm. So you touched on it briefly um, in your 90 seconds, but after you left Westminster, you then started working as a runner for various um, film companies. Um, and maybe tell us as your life as a, as a young man then, um, you know, after you left school, um, coming out into what I'm guessing was 1980s um, London. Yeah. Um, what, was, what was life like for, for then for you? And what was, what was Jamie like as a, as a, as a young man? I think I was still socially still very much 
I had two great friends who had been my best friends since I was prepubescent, Phil and Dom. And Phil was this incredible conformist, but shining like the sun, kind of beautiful cherub of a boy. He was a sort of violin scholar, grade eight violin by the time he was 10, um, captain of football, captain of rugby, head boy. You know, the teachers were trying to talk him out of being my friend. You know, we would do much better than Cato. Um, and then my other friend, Dom, was the exact opposite, an anarchic maniac um, who just was expelled from every school he went to, even Beedales, which was almost a school invented for the kids that were in, expelled from everywhere else. You know, he, he even managed to get expelled from there. And he was just like a total unhinged genius. He could, he was an amazing entertainer, motorbike renegade, artist, fine artist, extraordinary fine artist. Um, and was just, parents were terrified of him. Um, you know, like kids were not allowed to play with him, you know, like, and they were my two main influences growing up. Um, and um, when I was 20, Dom died very, very suddenly. Until that point, I was very much like just doing what they thought I should do. You know, like I wore the cult clothes, the Levi button ups that they too thought were cool. We listened to the clash and the jam and and the bands that they thought were cool. The, you know, like I just took my lead on the things that I liked a lot, um, socially, certainly from them. And then when Dom died, when I was 20, um, it was like electric volts to my brain. It was like such a wake up at that moment was the moment at which I stopped being a follower socially and started liking what I liked. And it, I don't know, it was very strange. Like I, I always felt guilty for many years. I don't anymore, but for my twenties, I always felt very guilty that when Dom died and I'd heard that he died, of course it was tragic, but weirdly there was almost as much feeling of excitement as there was um, of sadness, grief. There was the normal human grief of losing your best friend and, and the confusion and the suddenness. But it was almost like a little part of my brain said, nothing's ever going to be the same now. Something so extraordinary has happened. It like gave me a hall pass. Like no one can tell me what to do now. Dom's died. My best friend's died. No one can expect me to toe the line. No one can. Anything I do from this point is legit because Dom's died. I can do what the fuck I like. That's really how it felt. It kind of gave me this hall pass to be and choose anything. And I left my job that day and I've never had a job since. Um, and I started about, I just picked up a guitar. I hadn't ever played guitar before, but I felt so touched. I wanted to, to say that I wanted to express this amazing feeling that was going through my body. I wanted people, everyone to feel. I remember very soon after Dom died, walking down the street and just looking at everybody just going about their day. And to them, it was just another Tuesday. And I was thinking, don't they realize, can't they feel, I was so enlivened, so plugged in. I couldn't understand almost for a moment. Of course I could intellectually, but on a visceral level, I couldn't understand how everyone could just be going about their day as if nothing can't you all feel what's going on <laughs> you know and uh i just wanted to express that uh and so i started writing songs i must have written a song a day for five years you know i was just like constantly churning out songs and started a group started a, pop, a band um and um did nothing except play music for the next 16 years just every day all the time um and liked it was like i became a rebel not a rebel but i it's that's when i fully embraced being a misfit it's like when i felt proud of not fitting in for at that moment because dom didn't fit in either and i felt part of his lineage you know like that i was the banner holder for whatever dom was all about you know um so i felt this kind of pride at being his best friend and at, and at walking the path of not fitting in suddenly became something to be proud of. And, um, 
yeah, from that moment on, I just played music. Amazing. So, you know, a, a 20 year old's best friend dying is a, is a, is a life changing event, you know, whichever way you look at it. And yet it seemed to give you this permission almost to really step into you and to carry on for him as well. He sounds like an incredible, incredible inspiration, Jamie, like a maniac, a maniac. And you know, sometimes mani maniacs have a bad rap sometimes, don't they? Um, yeah, he used to drive his motorbike bike around the inside of Regent's Park through all the paths. Uh, we used to, to go on Uzi patrols, steal things. Um, you know, like there were no rules. We'd, we'd, we'd be up all night walking around London. These are the days you could get into places, you know, well, there wasn't such high security in London in those days. So you could sort of climb over a not very well locked fence and be in the inside of Battersea Power Station, rooting around the girders and the sort of old bits of wood. You know, you had access to all kinds of things now, which you could don't have access to where there are now, there are cameras and proper security. But we would be under the bridges of the Thames looking for things, you know, we were kind of exploring, um, around the edges of life you'd go into i remember we went into the pompidou center in paris and we could see sort of some door that was obviously not meant for the general public but we looked at each other and went oh, i wonder what's in there we'd like just sort of slipped in there suddenly we were in the underneath workings and the plumbing of the building and like you know we would love sort of going exploring off piste <laughs> see what we can see and um, I, I don't know why but the artful dodger just came into my head when you were describing him um then yeah no it was great and when you stole something or when you got away with something it was and even when we got arrested which you know would occasionally happen we never thought we could get we felt kind of bulletproof we didn't think we were ever going to be in big trouble we'd be joking around with the policeman and we would crack them up you know and the more you could make the policeman laugh the more yeah they put you in the cells for a little bit but then they'd let you go and with a clip around the ear you know they no one ever really charged us with anything very serious um, in our teenage years. We were just we were just troublemakers, but not harmful troublemakers. And I remember we would once go around with this Uzi machine gun, this pump action machine gun, and we Uzied this taxi driver once who was just minding his own business, reading the newspaper by the side, and he chased us throughout london i was driving this volkswagen beetle and we're like nearly killed me. we're going through red lights just trying to escape this fuming taxi driver and you know eventually through covent garden through leicester square all these places screaming through until we finally saw two policemen and we'd like mounted the curb and jumped out the car we were like help help there's a mad taxi driver trying to kill us and they looked at us a little bit confused suddenly this taxi sideways skids to a stop on the other side of the road this guy gets out starts running towards us two policemen have to restrain him um they take his number and send him off and then they come to us and they're like so you've been going around london squirting people with an uzi water pistol and we were like mm, yeah. And they just sort of lined us up against the wall and just soaked us, the policeman, with, with the machine gun and gave it back to us. And they went, try and be more careful next time. That was kind of the way that policemen treated us. You know, they, they, they just, we were a bit of a laugh, you know. But yeah, with Dom, like, we felt kind of bulletproof in that way that, you know, we never thought we were ever in any, in any danger. Uh, what did Dom look like? Can you describe him for us? He was tall, blonde, very, very fair skinned, um, very, very light blue eyed um, young man. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's just acknowledge and honour him in you Definitely. with a breath together. Dom Evans. Uh, okay, so here's you as a 20 year old with the world at your feet, you know, deciding, all right, this is it. I'm going to be that maverick. I'm going to be that one. I'm not going to have a job again. Um, I'm going to play music. I'm going to write music every day. Um, what happened next? Well, um, started this hippie. What, what happened next was like around that time, I have to say what, what also happened around that time was I saw something on telly. I saw this pop group called the Hot House Flowers 
playing live on telly and I was so blown away by the singer Liam Unwenley the way that he was just so total like a mad preacher Irish blues singer like sort of gospel vibe I was just like fuck that is amazing everyone was rocking out he was jumping up and down slamming his honky-tonk piano and I just said I want to be him <laughs> you know I want to do that I was so inspired so my first group which is called the Big Truth Band was really very similar to Hot House Flowers, less Irish, uh, more sort of Rolling Stonesy, maybe a tiny bit, you know, um, but you know, gospely, bluesy, rock and roll. And um, my hair was getting long by this point. We used to wear very bright colours and sort of caftans and waistcoats and bare feet on stage. Totally the wrong time. I mean, in, in a way, like it was so the culturally out of step you know what was going on culturally was acid and house music and you know the people dance music was coming in and, and like you know sportswear so we just did not fit musically with what was going on in the world at all but we were just like on one and we would travel all around with the circuit of universities we were like this cottage industry we had a mailing list and just before computers we were just sitting around my mum's kitchen table my mum was like super supportive she let us um rehearse in her basement and she uh, I think she she would pay for our first run of t-shirts <laughs> and um, we would we would literally do our mailing list by snail mail you know with a million you know we'd like it would take all six of us all evening folding and enveloping and stamping all, all these and um, we would go around all the different universities which we became the mascots of you know we would play the summer ball or the whatever and we would play to, I don't know, like 400 to 1,000 people on all these gigs. But it was a lot to us. Um, and uh, we rocked out. We, you know, we were so dedicated. We were rehearsing every single day, straight after work um, or straight after, you know, like whatever we were doing all day or one of them was at work. You know, we were rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing harmonies, intros, endings, composing, trying something else set lists oh god um and we bought a really crappy van that we would just god knows we would drive anywhere for a gig uh north yorkshire i remember some of our best gigs were in this place called ripon um and we just were on the road for the next five years solidly till i was like 25 maybe nearly 26 somewhere around then we just did nothing except that um, and that was actually, um, I missed that. I was, I was, we were like a gang, you know, we were the, the closest friends. We were just with each other all the time. And it was such a great feeling of being part of a gang. It was us against the world. You know, if we did a gig and everyone was loving it afterwards, sharing the joy of having just taken Coventry, um, we uh it was such a wonderful shared victory and so many wonderful in jokes and silly songs we would sing and and like such an amazing safety in our family of musicians and the other bands that we used to hang out with we started one time we were on the way back from a gig again it was like yorkshire and it was like two in the morning or one in the morning wherever it was we got to the watford gaps um station and we were eating our usual middle of the night terrible food on the way back and there was another group there um i don't know what they were called now not matisse it was the name of a french artist which was mainly cello and voice roddy and julia um and they were taking the piss out of us for being hippies even though they were hippies massively and they invited us to come down to a club called troubadour that used to be by by Fulham or somewhere near there in London, or Brompton Street. And we went down there as these fresh-faced, long-haired hippies, and we already had these amazing four-part harmonies to all our songs, but now we were doing it acoustically with like bongos and three acoustic guitars. And we became like a central feature of this club, the Troubadour, and met lots of other groups and lots of other musicians. And there was a really beautiful scene around, um, the late 80s early 90s in, in the early 90s beautiful folky scene going on in various clubs in london particularly the troubadour 
and um what a fire risk that place was god it was in this basement no windows one tiny door if there had ever been any problem there everyone would have died um but we had this lovely community and we'd start playing other festivals and the strawberry fair and um had this beautiful time from 20 to 25 of being hippie folky harmony singing loved up uh, musicians mm. it was wonderful that feeling of being in a band and being part of a family and having you know you against the world i think was the world that the words that you used is an incredible feeling isn't it yeah really amazing I've, I've i've never quite had it till this day since then i mean i was in other bands since then and there you had it a bit we never had it like that hmm. i'm guessing it's a time of life thing as well in your early 20s that yeah what was the name of the band again big truth band big truth band and who are all the members of it well there was me uh uh, singing there was Paulie who played rhythm guitar and was the first person that I wrote songs with you know we wrote all the songs together and he taught me guitar um, and we just you know we were always together writing songs um, there was Aubrey on the bass uh, who was uh, sort of a very funny curly haired um, very gifted bass player there was Servan from Armenia who played piano and was an amazing computer coder he left the band at, um, after a few years and sold the first 3d package to microsoft for like 2 million aged like 24 years old which that was when 2 million was a lot of money um there was um matt um on electric guitar who's a massive keith richards addict an incredible electric guitar player who's now married to my ex-wife um and there was Sebastian, who's still my closest friend to this day on the drums, who's, uh, yeah, he's now a psychotherapist in San Francisco. Um, so there were six of us in the first lineup. Yeah. Well, we, we need to have, a, uh, definitely need to have a breath with the Big Truth Band. And, you know, I'd love everyone to just, if you didn't have that feeling of being in a gang and taking on the world, just feel, you know, you should, feel imagine what that is like to to have that feeling within you being in a gang and taking on the world so we've gone over our hour jamie but are you all right to carry on for another oh, five yeah, ten minutes the pleasure. pleasure so i think i'd like to try and get up to the point um you know up to up to a good point where maybe you moved on from music or or some point around then so i'm guessing after five years together something happened to the big truth band yeah it just felt like enough i started getting into spiritual things um and became more interested in body work and meditation i don't really i don't know if it was really meditation whatever it was i'm not sure but i sort of chi you know qigong and breath work not probably exactly the way that you do it but you know mantak chi microcosmic orbit um tantric stuff although i didn't know it was tantric at the time i've since learned that it was tantric but for us it was just moving energy between organs um, and exploring things beyond the material ego plane. And I met a woman um, who I accidentally, but not accidentally, we got pregnant um, and had my first kid aged 25, 26, I think popped out at 26, not sure, India Rose. Um, and uh, it just felt like a new chapter. It felt like, you know, we didn't have a record deal yet. All the A&R people from the major labels used to come to our gigs, but they came with no interest in signing us just because it was such fun gigs. You know, they would come just for the laugh, for the crack, but we were never really going to get probably a record deal. We were a bit ridiculous um, and uncool. So I had a kid 
that's going to be a big life change, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I say I never had a job again after 20. I did have to get a job then very briefly at that time. I then had to sort of think, shit, I better earn some, I've got to earn some money. I've got to having a child. I got a job as an English teacher and, um, I wasn't very into it, but I just did it. You know, like you had to get the paycheck at the end of the month, pay rent and things. And then some magic happened, uh, where I remember saying to Claire, Indy's mum, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done with not being able to play music all the time. What's going on? It was only a few months in, but I was like, I am done with this. Um, I was saying, I want a bit of luck. I'm ready for a bit of luck now. Not just a bit of luck, like a good gig that was good and then it carried on the same, but a bit of luck that really lifts everything to the next level. I remember meaning it so much as I said it, as I affirmed it. It was almost like that moment in Big where the curtains blow and you hear the twinkly magic hearing what was said, you know? And as I was like ranting on about this, I was putting the key in the lock to our flat and I could hear the phone ringing inside and I picked it up. And it was this guy called Rollo um, who said, you don't know me, but I've heard one of your songs. The production on it is the most uncool thing any of us in the studio have ever heard, but everyone can't stop playing this song. We love it. And we're just doing this little side project album at the moment called Faithless. Um, and just be just wondered if you'd like to come down and write a song with me. Um, great. Next day, rocked up at his studio, got on like a house on fire, became firm friends within five minutes just like absolutely loved each other laughing and mucking around and just had a real affinity and wrote this song within five minutes of getting there called don't leave basically what happened was he put a beat up on the desk he said could you write something to this and so i knowing he didn't really know very much about music he knew about production but he didn't know notes i just played the same notes as the song that he liked but with more you know in a different with more time on each one you know it wasn't the same pattern and wrote the song don't leave the next day we were recording it in the big studio in the posh studio and i was like wow this is amazing i was like really starry eyed and the record label come in and they're like wow this song is amazing and they were really like loving me up it was done within very few days suddenly it had radio one airplay and the the uh, record company came in again again, a very small little label of, called Champion Music. It was not like a major, it was like a maverick sort of funny old Jewish man that was like his own mad story and the press people coming in and they were like, look, Rollo, it's all very well you're doing this weird album. Because in those days, what the point of faith was Rollo was saying, why does music always have to be all house music or all hip hop or all folk music on each album? Because that's how it was racked in all the shops. You had the hip hop over there and you had the dance music over there and you had the pop and the folk over there. It was all segregated. And Rollo was like, that's not my musical taste at all. I want on one album all the different styles that I like. And everyone was like, oh, you can't do that. Where would they rack it? That was literally, where would you rack it? How would you sell it? But he did it anyway as a little side project. And um, so the press people coming in, Rollo, it's all very well you doing this album, but you know, we need pictures. We need to tell the journalists who you are, what, what this is. Who's in the band? Is it a band? If so, who's in the band? And he was like, all right, all right. Um, all right, it's me, uh, Jamie, Maxie, and, and Sister Bliss, all right? Well, they go, fine. Okay, thank you. We'll have some photos tomorrow. So suddenly I'm in a band, you know, like I had no one asked me if I wanted to be in it. Um, but I was in a signed band. I was like, wow, we've got a record deal. Music's going to come out. And then Rollo's speaking to the head of the label and he goes, this Jamie guy's great. And Rollo goes, yeah. And when we do Jamie's album, he's got so many great songs already written. You ate da 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 da. So before I knew it, I had two record deals all on the same day and no one had had a conversation with me about it, but I'd kind of overheard that this was the case. Um, so overnight, I went from being an English teacher to having two record deals um, and I, could, I left that job. Um, and then Faithless, for the first year, of course, nobody was interested, as was predicted. Everyone was like, who are they? What is this? Is it folk music? Is it house music? Like, how do you release a house record? Like, insomnia or salvame and then release a ballad like don't leave who are these people and so of course in the first year we didn't sell any records and then in the second year out of the blue 
when the German label started releasing it, again, with not much hope of anything happening, the wonderful gay people of Munich decided that insomnia was their anthem for their love pride march thing and we just went number one all over the world overnight we just like it went number one or number two in germany then in switzerland then in austria then in france then in italy then in, you know it just like let frogged and then it came back to england where they re-released it and became number two number one you know everywhere Spice Girls were number one, we were number two, you know, like suddenly it was massive and all the venues changed from 200 people to 15,000 people and we were on with Sting and the Fugees and everybody else and just out of some random event from the Munich Pride March. Well, it seems also that random event was you turning the key in your flat door yeah. to your missus. I'm ready for some luck now and I'm you know I don't mean just a little bit of luck I'm meaning life-changing luck and then yeah. suddenly all that happened um yeah well, <laughs> how did you call that in maybe just give some advice to people who are in that position that they want some life-changing luck what's yeah, your secret no, sauce there just really mean it I really meant it as I said it, as I said it, I visualized it, I felt it and I felt that it was right that I should have it, you know, like, <laughs> not right like I deserved it any more than anyone else, but I just felt, yeah, I had my, all my yes was in every atom. So that, and also to the people listening, every single bit of success I've had has always come from an unexpected place. It's like you do all the work over here, but the breakthrough comes from over there. It's something very non-linear about luck. Um, like every big budget I've ever had since, like, since, since then, you know, like leaving Faithless, I did a project called One Giant Leap and the second One Giant Leap movie and album is quite a big budget. Um, I was actually, every meeting I've had where I've got a big budget for one of my projects has always been a meeting I was in for something else. I've never once got the budget for the thing I went for the meeting for. I've never once gone to a meeting to get the budget for something and got the budget ever in my career. Every single time I've got a big budget or resources or support or a deal for one of my things, I was always, not usually, always in a meeting for something else. So what's your advice there? Just being open to it? Exactly. Just realize that, that anything can happen at any moment. And there's a magical portal in meetings when you finished talking about what you came to talk about, but you haven't got your hat and left yet, where you start talking about, oh, I see your picture there. Did you take that in? Oh yeah, my wife. And suddenly you get into a little random tangent conversation that then turns into something which was the real reason you were there. Hmm. So, you know, just leave space in all your meetings, in all your pre-productions, in all your productions, in all your endeavors, leave space for magic to happen. Don't clutter everything together so there's not space for something to breathe through the spaces. There we go. Leave space for magic to happen. That's good advice for life, really, isn't it? Yeah, because it's always happened in the space between, like the composer Debussy said, music is the space between the notes. We're so fixated on the notes and the control trips and the strategies and this is what I'm doing and I've done an Excel sheet and ABC getting to the end. The plan, the Yang deliberate certified obvious thing. But all the magic happens in the cracks in between those obvious things. Mm. Um, so, you know, let the yin filter through in between the cracks of all the Yang that you've planned. Don't expect your plans to be the thing that happens. It's all about your effort your enthusiasm, your commitment, your resilience, your carrying on and on no matter what. Um, it's, it's always come from my positive attitude, not from my deliberate endeavors. Mm. Like with One Giant Leap, we were given millions to do the second one, but we would have done it for five grand. We would have done it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the, the trick of great art and great creative projects only do ones that you would do anyway even if it wasn't going to be big only do something that you're passionate about do it so that even if it never gets big it was still time well spent even if it didn't you're having such a good time
you were into it. Mm, well, that's great advice. Being into it is what generates money and other people can feel it. Neil Gaiman talks beautifully about this. Things, projects you, that are done because you think they'll make a lot of money, they never really come to anything. But things you're doing because you're just into it, it's infectious. Humans can smell that and they want to be part of it. Mm. <laughs> I like that idea. You can feel it. You can feel the passion. You can feel the energy. You can feel the creativity. And, the, and that's what people are drawn to. Well, um, we're at quarter past now. I'm going to... We do part two another day. I was going to say, would you come back to do part two? You know it. You know how much I love talking about myself. Of course. Of course <laughs> I know that. This is like your interview for Westminster College all over again, isn't it? Yeah. Please, I'll give you attention, please, Jamie. Please. Okay. Well, let's, let's do that because there's still more part of your journey. Um, you know, for me, which is going to be the really interesting bit um, that I would like to hear about, um, about your transformation from a, like a, you know, a, a musician into being a facilitator right. and a leader. Um, and it, for you, it may be exactly the same path, but there is a, there is a change there. So, um, well, let's just finish then. Let's finish, with, well, we'll obviously be taking a breath together to finish, but let's ask this question now. Um, let's just go back to that. Jamie, who is like in his mid late twenties, who's got um, a little daughter, but has suddenly found himself in a in a huge, in a huge band. Um, what did that Jamie want to inspire in everyone? Um, what was his mission? What was his point? What was his message? To enjoy the thrill without making it meaningful that was our mantra in faithless there was a certain once you once you've checked out spiritual things and 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 the meaning of life things you know that it's not the big fame or the big money that is what where the meaning of life is to be derived so there's almost a kind of a a, a kind of a dichotomy or something that or not exactly a guilt, but when you're massive, you're really enjoying the roaring of the cloud, crowds and the flashing lights and the thrill of being massive. But you don't want to buy into that the fact that that's not very spiritual, that's not very humble. Um, so there's a kind of a split. And we kind of realized that it's actually, no, it's all right to enjoy the thrill of being massive, as long as you don't make that the central meaning of your life, you don't make it mean something, that that means you're really special or that means that, you know, God loves you more or whatever. So we kind of found a way to really enjoy what was going on without kind of buying into the trap of what was going on. Ah, that's a great message. Enjoy the thrill, but don't make it the meaning. Yeah. Thrilling, not meaningful. Okay. Well, let's have a breath with uh, uh, allowing ourselves to enjoy, enjoy the thrill of maybe it's being in a huge, you know, selling band, but maybe it's just the thrill of going out and having tea on a, you know, as I did on my um, yard this morning, or going out and smelling the flowers and nature and spring on Hampstead Heath. So allowing ourselves to enjoy that thrill as well. Let's, mm. let's finish off by having a breath um, with that. Well, Jamie Catto, thank you for being my guest this morning. And I'm guessing I will be having you back on here very soon. So if you're watching this on YouTube, um, come back for part two, whenever that is. Thanks, Benji. I love you. Love you too.